So friends, Professor Mayank Srivastava received his PhD degree from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. For his PhD work, he received excellence in research award for his PhD thesis and industrial impact award from IIT Bombay in 2010. He is among the first recipient of Indian section of American TR35 award. The first Indian to receive IEEE EDS Early Career Award. Besides, he is an IEEE senior member and has received several other national awards and honors of high repute, like National Academy of Sciences, NASI Young Scientist Platinum Jubilee Award 2018, Indian National Academy of Sciences Young Scientist Award 2018, Indian National Academy of Engineering. Innovator Entrepreneur Award 2018, Indian National Academy of Engineering Young Engineer Award 2017, INE Young's Associate 2000, since 2017, Indian Academy of Sciences Young Associate 2018 to 2023, Department of Electronics and Information Technology DIT Young Faculty Fellowship. He has received best paper awards from several international conferences like in Intel Corporation Asia Academic Forum, VLSI Design Conference, and EOS ESD Symposium. Professor Srivastava's current deals with experimentation, design, and modeling of beyond CMOS devices using graphene and TMDCs. So I just wanted to inform all the attendees that he has done his seminal work in the field of graphene and which he will be sharing in his next talk. Today his talk is more general about uh, what India can do for electronic industry. Wide band gap material based power semiconductor devices and EST reliability in advance and beyond CMOS nodes. He had held visiting positions in Infineon Technologies Munich. 2000 October 2008 and again in May 2010 to July 2010. He worked for Infineon Technologies, East Fiskai, New York, USA, IBM Microelectronics, Intel Mobile Communications, and Intel Corporation. Mobile and Communication Germany between 2010 to 2013. He joined ISC as a faculty in 2013, where he is currently working as associate professor. Professor Srivastava has over 125 peer-reviewed international publications and 47 pay, uh, patents. So, Mayank, we are really honored to have you on our platform and already 225 attendees have joined it. So, I will not waste time in this uh, much more introduction. We would like to hear from you how the future of world electronics and possible role India can play. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you, Puneet, uh, um, and welcome everyone. Thanks. Uh, also, thanks to IEEE Bangalore section for inviting me and uh, giving me this platform to present my views. I have been talking about this topic since uh, I believe more than three years now. And uh, after each talk, you know, I get many questions, and those questions have been helping me to improve uh, the nature and the quality and the content of this talk. So what you see is basically a version which has gone through possibly 25 revisions after possibly more than 25 talks on this topic I have given across the country. Uh, so thanks again and uh, let's start. So before I get into what I'm going to talk about, uh, let me uh, quickly cover what we do or what we explore in ISC. This will set the context uh, in terms of you know, what we do and what has helped us to come up with this kind of uh, a vision for the country. So we work on electron devices uh, or you know, um, at the core of micro and nano electronics. And we pursue both science as well as the technology threats. Uh, so the science threats are concerned, we look into uh, several scientific explorations or you, know, you can also call it uh, physics uh, at nanoscale. And at the technology thread, we work on uh, nanoscale CMOS, uh, replacement of nanoscale CMOS with 2D materials and graphene, and also uh, power semiconductor devices, both silicon and beyond silicon kind of uh, materials. 
And you know, with all our work, we try to cater a range of applications uh, which are you know, uh, targeted as uh, future uh, microelectronics technologies. Uh, of course, uh, all this work has been, you know, was possible because of uh, all the students who has worked in my group, you know, a lot of funding agencies who have funded uh, the research here and the, the research lab and, you know, many uh, uh, visionary people who would have, uh, would have, you know, supported or given their insights uh, from time to time. So let's start. Uh, here is the outline of uh, my talk. Uh, and what I'm going to do is basically I have I have divided this into three different time segments. One is, you know, what is going to happen in near future, which is advanced uh, and beyond silicon CMOS. Uh, the second is, you know, what is going to happen, let's say, in five to ten years uh, time frame, you know, how silicon is going to be changed. And that's, you know, things related to neural computing and power devices. And then, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the far future, let's say 10 years down the line, uh, I have a couple of uh, content covered, which are related to D materials and nano power, which I'm also going to cover in my talk. So basically it's divided into three time segments, near future, mid future and far future. Okay, so let me begin with this uh, slide. And I, I always uh, feel glad to show this slide, you know, uh, for instance, how electronics was uh, 60 years back and how it is today. So what you see on your left hand side is an IBM calculator, which was developed uh, in 1960s. And you know what it can do uh, is possibly uh, not even as advanced as what a, a grade two uh, kid can do today, right? So uh, you need, uh, you know, in those days, uh, you need a giant electronic system to do very basic calculations, this electronic system would possibly be bigger than my office size. And on the, on the right hand side, what you see is uh, a more latest laptop, uh, which possibly can do uh, possibly more than several billion times operation compared to this electronic calculator 60 years back and is certainly, you know, uh, several thousand times smaller and lighter than this. And so the question is, you know, for the general audience, uh, how this uh, happened, you know, what, what made this possible? What made this possible is the advancement in the, uh, or the technological evolu evolution and the advancement in microelectronics or semiconductor technologies. So for instance, uh, at the very top, what you see is a vacuum uh, tube triode, which was, you know, uh, very common in 1940s. And you know, you all know that then uh, semiconductor transistor got invented uh, around 47, and then there was this evolution of semiconductor-based transistors and semiconductor-based chip. So what was, let's say, uh, several uh, tens of grams in 1940, and uh, pretty bulky in size, you know, uh, got changed to several million transistors integrated uh, in a small chip, possibly much smaller than a cent, right? Uh, this slide will give you a different perspective or basically, uh, you know, will, will help you understanding the same thing uh, from a different viewpoint. So if you see in a very early 90, uh, 1900, uh, you know, uh, you had vacuum tubes, these were pretty bulky. And then you got these discrete transistors, uh, which of course uh, made life easier, but still the electronics was pretty bulky during those days. And then you got these integrated chips where you have uh, several millions and billions transistors integrated uh, on the same chip. And the most latest chip that you see in the market would have close to 5 billion transistors. Each transistors, each transistors you know, of the size of seven nanometers uh, and the overall chip size not more than one inch by one inch, right? So this is the kind of technological evolution or the evolution in the microelectronic technologies that people, you know, uh, that the world has seen which has changed the, the shape of electronics uh, in, in the uh, in last 100 years, right? So the question is what is going to happen in future? I mean, I prepared this slide a few years back uh, and I thought that this is how um, the, uh, the technology is going to change. And apparently till 2017, you know, things have been uh, looking the same way as it was projected. But the question is what is going to happen beyond, uh, let's say 2020, I mean, there are many options uh, to change silicon, for instance, uh, you have uh, three five materials, you have uh, quantum materials, two D materials, graphene, and more recently, you know, gallium nitride to replace silicon in power devices, and so on. So there are many, many, many uh, material options available today to replace silicon, and 
as a result of that the, because of the because of the new features they offer you know there are many new applications which are also emerging uh, you know uh, in more recent time and th I, i'm going to talk about those materials i also talk about those applications but before that you know let's let's see what has pushed this kind of uh, significant scaling or the evolution of electronics so you know you all know that uh, 15 or 20 years back the market was heavily populated by cpus so what you see all around were desktop systems right desktop computers or possibly servers and data centers but more recently in last 10 years or 15 years because of the uh, the demand of uh, you know uh, handheld systems like smartphones notebook tablet uh, wireless systems and so on there has been a push for developing more and more system on chips which is you know you develop the the entire system on a on a single chip and that's the reason why you see lot more transistors being integrated inside the same chip and that's also the reason why you see a significant uh, you, you know uh, a boom in in the in the market as far as semiconductor technology are concerned the question is what is there in system on chip right i mean for instance in a cpu like chip you will have memory and logic i mean your job is done you have memory uh, and you have logic uh, devices right and these kind of functionalities but if you want a system on chip you need you know everything you need everything which you possibly had on board in the in the previous times for instance you need interfaces you need all kind of analog mixed signal modules you need rf modules you need several new features like audio video gpu accelerations and so on and of course because of that you need several uh, new interfaces to interface your chip with the outside world and a lot of reliability and protection so let's see how the soc has evolved and this will help you understand you know where we are and what is going to happen in future for instance in early 2000 when you had these bulky you know uh, cell phones which were able to do only calls and possibly small text at those times what you had in those chips were digital baseband and analog baseband and as time progressed you know uh, industry got uh, integrated rf trans receivers power management units or which is the dc dc or the charging units or the power conversion units on the same chip and uh, gradually fm radio and power amplifier so you know uh, if you see in a decade time span industry was able to integrate as many as possible functionalities on the same chip and today if you see most of the semiconductor chips or the cell phones would have one core soc and that soc is capable of doing most of the job so for instance this is what it is right i mean this is the reason why you are able to see these smartphones which are capable of uh, doing all kind of operations which are earlier possible using uh, using individual chips and those chips were were integrated on board and that's the reason why cell phones were so bulky or the the gadgets were so bulky and you know people were not able to integrate a lot more functionalities but now people are able to do that because everything is integrated on the same chip right now what it enables uh, what it enables is you know uh, the future applications like iot i mean you can think of controlling your your smart car uh, your car your your consume uh, electronics uh, and many other things uh, remotely from uh, using your ipad uh, you can think of uh, a system where for instance everything is connected to each other everyone can monitor each other everyone can control um, you know uh, many many more gadgets compared to what we can do now so this is what is basically the 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 possibility being projected for near future so this is the possibility being projected for for near future where you know you have more connected devices uh, more con remote con remote uh, operation more remote control uh, being enabled and all of that can happen only if you have these smart gadgets with system on chip uh, inside it right so let's understand from the semiconductor technology point of view that what is needed for a system on chip or what is needed to enable a system on chip right when for instance if you want to make a cpu chip what you need is you need a a, a, a technology platform which gives you devices which can op, uh, do the digital operation right is switching on and off kind of operation right uh, and since you are operating on on ac power you are not concern too much about the leakage uh, since this is digital just switching on and off you are not concerned about any other functionality like high voltage functionalities rf functionalities and so on right whereas when you go for from cpu to soc like chip uh, you need many more functionalities on the same uh, technology platform like the technology platform or the kind of bucket which in the semiconductor term called pdk uh, you need many more device features or options and technology options right for instance you need high voltage capability you need devices which can do rf uh, and mixed signal which uh, you need devices which are uh, which operate at very small leakage which are 
you know, um, uh, without losing performance. And also you need interconnect uh, or very high gate and metal integration density, right? So that you can integrate more and more transistors and functionalities on the same chip. And that's not easy, right? Uh, so what is going to basically happen? I mean, what is going to Professor happen? Mayank, uh, Professor Mayank, one second. There is a feedback. People are not able to see the heading of the slide. So can you, this uh, hatched portion, can you remove, please, from your desktop? Uh, which portion? Uh, there is some masking is happening. Some One more screen is open at the top of the slide. Is it fine now? Uh, no. Yeah, now it is much better. Yes, yes. Great. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Thanks for this feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. No problem. So uh, we were talking about uh, you know what basically uh, this kind of integration enables and what is going to be the future challenge if you want to push silicon further, right? One is the scaling. So scaling. I mean, you know that current technology is FinFET. Uh, FinFET are these 3D transistors. So the question is, what is going to happen beyond FinFET? Uh, I mean, industry has been working on nanowires uh, for more than 25 years. People worked on tunnel fits. On the other hand, the, the integration challenge, for instance, integrating more and more metal inside the same chip or making the metal density uh, higher. And uh, the, the other one is, you know, uh, enabling high voltage device capabilities. For instance, you know, the current FinFET technology can not do SOC, can only do uh, digital. Uh, and can do very limited SOC operation, you know, going up to 3.3 volt. But if you want to make it, uh, you know, capable of doing SOCs or automotive, you have to integrate more functionalities, which means you need to have more metal density and you need to have higher voltage uh, handling capability, right? And if you want to change FinFET, if you want to scale further, you also need to think about nanowire and tunnel fits. So let me ask this question at this stage. What kind of fab India should invest in? We all know that we don't have a fab. We don't have a commercial fab in the country, though there are a couple of strategic fabs. And the question often is that, you know, what kind of fab uh, India should invest in? Uh, there are two kinds of fabs. One is a digital fab, uh, where you basically make uh, uh, chips which are capable of digital operation. Mostly these kind of chips will go in uh, data centers, uh, servers, and, and uh, CPUs. And the other kind of fab is a SOC fab or an analog fab, uh, so to say. Uh, and uh, the, on the one hand, the digital fab has an obsolescence rate of two to three years, which means by the time the fab is ready, possibly the technology will get outdated. Whereas the digital fab or SOC fab has a lifetime of, or the technology has a lifetime of more than 10 years. And that's the reason why I believe that, you know, a country like India should start with the SOC fab as far as silicon technology is concerned, right? So let's see what we have been doing uh, in IST to basically enable uh, SOC capabilities in these advanced technology node. As I said, you know, one aspect you need to push beyond FinFET is tunnel fit. And we have been doing a lot of work on tunnel fit and newer uh, nanoscale transistor design. Uh, I will not get into the detail of the work. Uh, this is covered in my future talk. Uh, but to give an insight that, you know, we came up with a couple of ideas uh, uh, where uh, we were able to demonstrate how one can basically using the know-how from FinFET technology, how one can push that to FinFET, uh, to tunnel fit uh, kind of architecture, and how one can scale uh, these, these transistor geometries further, right? Uh, the other aspect we have been working on, and that's basically a challenge uh, across many uh, industries around the world, is how to enable high voltage uh, capabilities in these uh, ultra, you know, scaled technologies. For instance, to give you a feeling, you know, the transistor dimensions uh, are of seven nanometer in the current FinFET technology, right? And you can imagine, you know, if you want to operate a circuit at, uh, let's say, 40 volt or 80 volt, you can imagine that you are going to apply 80 volt across those 7, 10 nanometers, right? And that's such a high electric field that, you know, every, nothing is going to survive. So the question is, the fundamental question is that how you solve this problem, how you enable this very high voltage operation in these ultra scaled technologies, right? So, uh, of course, uh, that's one fundamental question, but when you have a device, when you have an architecture, then there are many other challenges that, we, that you have to address, uh, which we have been working on since last five, 10 years uh, with, for instance, industries like Intel. In fact, we also enabled some of these technologies for our strategic foundries uh, to convert their, uh, their uh, low voltage uh, process to a high voltage process. 
Uh, other aspect of, of these high voltage technologies is a uh, requirement for the strategic needs. I mean, there are a lot of strategic needs where you can basically use these high voltage technologies or these high voltage chips, uh, and you can basically save a lot of uh, money, which is usually being spent in, in procurement from, uh, from foreign countries. So as I said, we have been working with the industry and in last 10 years, we have made significant progress in terms of understanding how you know, you can integrate these ultra scaled uh, 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 high voltage transistors in these ultra scale technologies. In fact, this is, this is from one of our recent work, which we did with Intel, and we were able to help industry in enabling some of these technologies in their ultra advanced uh, uh, nodes, right? So, um, so the question is, let me ask this question uh, at this stage. The question is how India can take a lead in future, right? So one is uh, silicon, of course, and if you want to basically invest in silicon, it has to be, for instance, uh, something like an analog fab or SOC fab. Uh, if we think beyond silicon, uh, you know, uh, how do we avoid what happened with silicon? I mean, we all know that we missed silicon bus in, in early times. And uh, the question is, can we avoid this in future? So, so far I was talking about if we want to invest on silicon, what kind of technologies uh, or fabs we should invest in. But if we want to invest in beyond silicon technologies, can we avoid, uh, you know, what happened in, in the past? And to make it happen, you know, my personal view is that, you know, one should take risk and jump the roadmap. For instance, you know, if you invest on technologies which are going to uh, become reality in next few years, by the time uh, you make it happen, possibly we'll be uh, again behind rest of the world. But if we invest proactively on disruptive technologies where, for instance, the learning from silicon like node is not so important, we certainly be able to, uh, to, to uh, make a, a significant difference in the world economics compared to what we could do with other technology nodes, right? So in this context, uh, with this view in mind, let me talk about some of the future technologies. For instance, I'll begin with beyond silicon CMOS where graphene and 2D material based flexible chips come into picture, right? So uh, you, most of you would have heard of graphene and carbon nanotubes. Graphene is uh, a one atom thick uh, sheet of carbon atom where the carbon atoms are arranged in a honeycomb or hexagonal uh, lattice fashion. Uh, to get into specifics, uh, each carbon atom is sp2 hybridized with other three carbon atoms. And you have in plane, uh, um, you have in plane pi bond and you have out plane sigma bond. And in fact, this, this pi bond is responsible for the kind of conductivity or the, the, the conductive performance that we get and out plane sigma bond is responsible for um, uh, the, uh, the, the strength that you have, right? So um, now if you fold graphene, what you get is a single wall CNT and multi wall CNT. Uh, depending on how you fold it, you will get single wall CNT and uh, you know, multi wall CNT. And again, depending on how you fold it, you will get metallic CNT or uh, semiconducting CNT, right? Now, if I talk about the properties of graphene and CNT, graphene, for instance, has uh, you know, shown to have the highest mobility. More mobility is a parameter which demonstrates or which basically, uh, which gives you an idea of how good the conductivity is in the material. Uh, theoretically, uh, graphene can operate at 20 terahertz kind of uh, transistor, uh, transistor frequency. Graphene also has very high thermal conductivity, which means that graphene uh, doesn't heat up or graphene electronics should not or will not heat up. And this other than that, you know, graphene also has many other interesting properties and far better properties compared to copper or silicon. And that's the reason why graphene is projected to be a wonder material. Uh, so I told you about terahertz. I told you about that graphene can operate at terahertz. This is one interesting area which graphene can enable, for instance, you know, which was not possible by, by silicon or any other technology. Uh, what, is what is terahertz? This is basically the gap uh, uh, between uh, you know, 300 gigahertz and 10 terahertz, which is microwave infrared frequency. And you know, that's the gap which is, which is not at all filled by any technology. For instance, anything less than 300 gigahertz, can be filled by conventional electronics. Anything more than 10 terahertz can be filled by, by uh, conventional optoelectronics, right? But anything which is in this window is, there's no electronics which can, which can control or manipulate radiation in this particular window, right? Uh, but there are many advantages of terahertz radiation. Uh, one is, of course, you can use it for homeland security because you, know, you can use it for imaging, non-invasive spectral identification. And also in communication, I mean, you can use it for high altitude communication uh, where you want very high bandwidth 
uh, or very high bandwidth data transfer and many other things. For instance, wireless interfaces, on-chip interconnected communication, so on. The question is what is missing, right? Uh, what is missing is technology for electronics to control and manipulate the terror's radiation for imaging, sensing, and communication, right? Uh, the core, you know, uh, there has been many programs around the world. I mean, uh, uh, around the world, for instance, there has been more than $100 million investment on graphene uh, technologies and possibly more than a billion dollar investment on overall 2D material technologies. Right. In India, we have a couple of programs, for instance, in ISC also there, there are a couple of programs funded by DST, DRDO and uh, Ministry of Information and Electronic Technology. Um, let me tell you where the where the world is. For instance, this chart shows that the record high performance uh, reported by IBM was 427 gigahertz in 2012. Right. I mean, so still you see there's a big gap, right? The, the theoretical cutoff frequency is around 220 terahertz, but the record high performance uh, reported till date is 427 gigahertz and that too by IBM, right? Um, why there's a gap? Because there are many, many, many technological challenges in, in terms of achieving graphene technology. Of course, I'll talk about the details of these challenges in my uh, future talk, but uh, want to highlight that we have been working on some of these challenges and we could achieve, uh, you know, uh, more recently, we could achieve a record high performance uh, graphene transistor technology. Uh, where we basically um, reported transistors which are 20% better in terms of performance compared to IBM's transistor. Uh, so transistor is not the only application where graphene can cater to, right? I mean, graphene, uh, because of the properties, for instance, you can use graphene for heat spreading because graphene has very high thermal conductivity and it doesn't heat up. Uh, if you use it as a heat sink, it will take out the heat and, and you know, uh, that material therefore can be used as heat spreading material. Graphene also has very high uh, EMI shielding capability, and you can also think of replacing the EMI shielding material from, from existing uh, electronic products uh, by graphene. And if you open any electronic system, you would have noticed that the, elect the EMI shielding itself, you know, accounts for a lot of weight. And if you remove that, for instance, at present some metal uh, uh, um, cage would be used. If you change that metal uh, EMI shielding material by graphene, which is almost massless, you are going to save significant amount of weight, right, and cost. Uh, graphene is also transparent to light, so you can think of uh, making transparent displays with graphene uh, and whatnot. I mean, there are many other applications, you just name it, for instance, tunable antenna, superinductor, supercapacitor, steroid detectors, and so on. The list is very long, right? So graphene is uh, not the only material in this 2D material family. As far as the 2D material family is concerned, there are many other materials. Graphene, as I said, is a semi-metal. You can use it for transistor. You can use it for analog and RF applications. You can use it for many other applications, but you cannot use it for digital application, which require very high on to off ratio. Now for digital application, what do you need? You need in semiconductor term is a band gap. Now what, um, so there are other 2D materials which offers band gap. For instance, you have phosphorine, you have uh, W, you know, you have tungsten and moly disulfide and dichalcogonides. The oxide can be replaced by uh, hexagonal boron nitride. Uh, and so on. So you can think of a system where you have all kind of 2D materials and their unique properties are used for many applications, something for transistors, something for RF, something for analog, something for optoelectronics, something for photonics and so on. And if you can integrate all of that inside the same chip, you can think of you know, systems which are able to cater to all kind of applications which silicon, for instance, cannot cater to in current, uh, current world. Uh, as I said, the reason is that, you know, the re depending on which 2D material you talk about, you get different kind of properties. You have materials which are, which can, which are fantastic insulators like hexagonal boron nitride with six electron volt band gap. You have transition metal dichalcogonides with, uh, you know, band gap ranging from one to three electron volt. You have black phosphorus or phosphorine with band gap ranging from 0.3 to two electron volt, and you have graphene without any band gap. And with the integration of these materials, you can, you, you can make all kind of, uh, you know, uh, device technologies and the integration of these de device technologies can help to, you know, enabling all kind of new applications which were not possible in the past. And what are these new applications? Let's see. So, for instance, you can think of flexible electronics, uh, high performance flexible electronics. The projected world market for flexible electronics by 2025 is $45 billion, right? Uh, you can think of, for instance, you know, uh, TV that you can fold and keep in your pocket or for instance, you can think of these flexible and rollable solar panels, which you can just fold and you can you can uh, keep it wherever you want. You can have solar panels, uh, lay, you know, uh, glued on your glass window or wherever you want, right? 
you can also think of lab on chip tattoos so these tattoos uh, will look like standard tattoos but will do a lot of health monitoring uh, and send the uh, the signal uh, in your in, in right you can think of uh, lightweight microwave one vehicles uh, for instance uh, you can think of these vehicles which look like insect or which are much smaller than insect and they can do or help in a lot of surveillance applications for instance one of the one of the technological challenge with these applications is the weight of the electronics but the moment you you know translate it from silicon and and metal like electronics to uh, graphene and 2d material massless electronics the weight is no more a concern and then you can basically enable these kind of technology application and you know what not i mean you just name it you you can think of uh, any application any flexible uh, application and you can you can enable with a 2d material right for instance you can think of uh, uh you know um uh, walls with uh, with integrated televisions or integrated screens and what not right so flexible electronics is going to be everywhere that's what is going to be projected that's what is projected for future uh and in fact one more application which is very interesting from for for flexible electronics is wearable technology for instance of course defense and strategic need that but you know it has been projected that uh, as time progresses we are going to wear more and more electronics in our body and that's where this kind of flexible massless electronics come into picture which can make the wearable technology uh, or wearable technology more realizable and and comfortable for for end user so this chart will basically give you an idea that you know if you think of any application the flexible electronic system or flexible system is going to cater to that right i mean whether it is this uh, consumer electronics or strategic electronics these are disruptive products which are projected for future and you know of course if we invest on disruptive technologies i mean this 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 create new market right so if you invest on these technologies there is nothing which is going to beat that okay so this chart again shows that the range of uh, technologies which a flexible electronic technology or the range of applications which a flexible electronic technology can cater to right now the question is uh, what the world is doing as far as flexible electronics uh, using 2d material is concerned so world has been heavily working on it i mean that's why i said you know there has been more than uh, uh, 1 billion dollar investment on 2d materials around the world and you know a lot of groups have been reporting uh, advancement with 2d material and flexible electronics right uh, and that was also one of the reason why we uh, thought that you know it would be uh, wise to invest time on 2d material and have our own program on 2d material so when we started working on 2d material 5 years back uh, the so you know couple of bigger the biggest challenge uh, around the 2d material technology we are following one was uh, you know uh, those who come from cmos background they would know that for a cmos operation you need a n type transistor and you need a p type transistor now n type transistor was uh, was pretty much possible with these 2d materials but nobody had demonstrated the p type transistor right second problem is that if you are not able to make contact of these 2d material with the 3d system or thebri world system right you cannot take any signal out of these transistors so contacting these transistors was another major challenge right and of course passivating these transistors because they are so sensitive they are just one atom thick they are so sensitive that you know they can they react to everything which is which is surrounded by them right uh, so uh, we addressed these three challenges and we basically worked on we were able to demonstrate record high performance transistors very high reliability Uh, along with the electron and hole transport or n and p type operation right i'll i'll talk about more details in future slides so the uh, this is in in short what we have been trying to achieve with the initiative on graphene in 2d material we have been you know working on component uh, development or basically the technology development with 2d material eventually to enable applications like brain computation high performance flexible electronics light wave electronics and wearable and bio implant and of electronics right uh, so it's not only the electronics which uh, can be catered by 2d material so you know the the other set of technology which is optical electronic can also be catered by 2d material and that's uh, another interesting thing as far the 2d material is concerned that you can think of chips where you have you have electronics and you have optical electronic integrated in the same chip now moving forward so what is basically projected for far future times uh using these 2d materials or using these uh, nano materials is for instance uh, brain or neural chip you know the question is can we mimic brain uh, or you think of you know a flexible 3d chip which works like brain right this is fascinating now why this is fascinating what kind of applications it can cater to i mean you can think of artificial vision uh, you can think of artificial uh, audition multi sensory 
function, right, uh, or even computations, or replacing the volume and computing by neural computing, right, uh, processing high dimensional noisy sensory data, which is often not possible with computational, uh, conventional computer architectures is possible with these kind of neural computers. And you just name it, there are many, many other applications which the neural computer uh, can cater to, which is not uh, possible with the computational or conventional computer architectures, right? Uh, the question is, you know, whether you want to go with the software route or the hardware route, and I'll give you the answer in the next slide. So the complexity, uh, the answer is following. For instance, you know, there was this uh, study where uh, to simulate one second of brain activity, you need 40 minutes of simulation time and around 80,000 uh, processors, right? So that's uh, that's the challenge. If you use conventional architecture, computational, conventional computing architecture. Uh, to simulate brain activity, right? And why this is challenging? Because of the kind of complexity in human brain. For instance, we have 100 billion neurons connected up to, you know, with 10,000 neurons, which makes 1,000 trillion synaptic connections, almost 1,000 terabyte kind of memory, right? So you have these many uh, trillion connections and terabyte kind of memory, which is typically not possible with conventional architectures, if you, or if you want to replace, uh, uh, use conventional architectures for neural computing. And that's the reason why you know one has to think of uh, brain chips or chips which basically emulate brain-like behavior. And of course, if they can be flexible and 3D-like brain, that is what is going to be projected or that is what is going to be the future. This is a concept, by the way, we, we patented in ISD. So moving forward, so I basically talked about uh, the, uh, the future of nanoscale CMOS or uh, nanoscale technologies. The parallel thread, you know, along with the nanotechnology is power semiconductor devices. And in power semiconductor devices, what is attractive these days is wide band gap power devices. Now, um, I should have told you in the very beginning that there are three kinds of processing. There's data processing, there's signal processing, and there's power processing, right? I mean, the data and the signal processing is something which is very common uh, to everyone. I mean, we all have seen data processing. We know what our computer, uh, laptop, or any other you know, computing device does, right? Signal processing is also something we are aware of. We are aware of signal being transmitted. We are aware of signal being received or transmitted and hence the signal is processed. But data processing is something which is very common to us, but we have often not noticed it. And what is that data, uh, what is that power processing, for instance? I mean, uh, any electronic gadget that we use requires certain power and power in certain format, right? The power we may receive in AC format and we may be requiring that power in a DC format. The power we may receive in high voltage format, we may re require that power in low voltage format. So what is that power processing? That power processing, the conversion of power from one format to the other format, one level to the other format. And that's where the power electronic come into picture. Any consumer electronic, you name it, you will use AC power and you will convert that power into some other format and other level, right? Uh, <clears throat> And that's the reason why these power devices are, are important, not just for you know, uh, commercial as well as strategic uh, in a strategic context. I mean, you just name any application from locomotive to automotive, to motor drive, to, uh, to cell phones, uh, automotive and whatnot. You have these power electronic systems or power converters everywhere, right? Now in power converters, there are two kinds of technologies. One is discrete technology. So where you have discrete power devices, uh, and other is integrated technology where you have this power system on chips. The power system on chip market projected to 2025 is 100 billion dollar, whereas the discrete technology market projected uh, projected uh, by 2023 for LDMOS is kind of around 10 billion dollar and gallium nitride hemp is close to 6 billion dollar, right? So what I'm going to talk about is gallium nitride hemp and I'll justify why, you know, India must invest on gallium nitride hemp. So as I already told you that uh, by 2023, the projected market is 6 billion dollar. Uh, but how this uh, translate into a much larger electronic systems market? For instance, what you see here is a power device market, which is $17 billion by 2022, that caters to a $134 billion electronic systems market. And this power device market, enabling this power device uh, local manufacturing, can also enable electronic systems, a power electronic systems market uh, done locally, right? Now, the question is, what do you need, you know, when you switch from one technology node to the other technology node? For instance, if you want to switch from silicon to a next generation like, like gallium nitride, what you need from this new material technology is you need high power density, you need high switching frequency, you need high reliability, you need uh, lower losses, lower cost, and lower time to market, right? 
and if you look into all kind of parameters you know the parameters which affect uh, various aspects like time to market switching frequency reliability and so on uh, from the system's point of view eventually the killer is the semiconductor what you need is a better semiconductor you need to work on both system and device at the same time you need a reliable semiconductor and of course reliability of your design right and uh, that's where gallium nitride comes into picture because that offers that advancement compared to silicon uh, if you see for instance silicon based uh, elect power electronic saturates close to uh, you know depending on voltage uh, range at which you are operating you know close to few hundred kilohertz to few megahertz whereas gallium nitride can push this to you know beyond megahertz operation and pushing beyond megahertz operation will significantly scale the size of the power electronic system which is not possible by silicon technology right and that's why gallium nitride is projected to be uh, projected to replace 100 to 1200 volt silicon devices by year 2022 Let's see why gallium nitride is so fascinating. I mean, if you look into this chart, gallium nitride offers very high band gap. It has much higher breakdown field. It has very high mobilities compared to silicon, uh, and more importantly, it can operate at very high volt, uh, very high temperatures, which is not possible by silicon. So, what does this mean? You know, you need a smaller system size. You need a smaller heat sink, uh, and you also basically save a lot on uh, on passive size by increasing the switching frequencies, which are which were limited in case of silicon technologies right um, as for the applications are concerned there are a number of applications where you know this kind of uh, you know technology is needed for instance from uh, electric vehicle to heavy electric vehicle to motor drive and inverters and ups technologies and so on right um, in fact worldwide there are many programs uh, on gallium nitride and there has been a lot of investment worldwide on gallium nitride and similarly there has been a program in isc as well funded heavily by drdo dit and um, it and dst now to give you an idea why one should basically think of replacing silicon i mean one aspect of course is is uh, is system size i know i told you about the performance in system size but is there anything else that is important you know if uh, if, if let's say we don't bother about system size so this is some calculation i did couple of years back and without getting into the details of calculation if i tell you that any conversion that we do there's a power loss and if you change that uh, the 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 backbone of conversion which is a power device uh, right uh, from silicon to gallium nitride we save a lot of energy for instance in india the power loss before it reaches to the consumer is 2% of india's gdp that's the kind of loss we currently have and if we want to save it we have to save the loss in the electronic systems or these power converters right for instance this is some projections uh, uh, you know done for some global data and and for for us systems and what it shows that you know when you replace silicon by gallium nitride in laptop tablet and cell phone you have 23% saving in terms of power when you replace uh, you know silicon by uh, by gan in variable frequency devices you know just in us you have 15 billion dollar saving right similarly in data centers you save around 12.7% energy loss if you replace silicon by uh, by gallium nitride right and if you look into these numbers you know this is uh, this is higher than the fdi received in in some of the previous years uh, also from the uh, from the startup point of view gallium nitride is just emerging as the right technology you know for emerging in economies and <clears throat> that's the reason why emerging economies like india can take a lead in gallium nitride if you see you know uh, it's not um, it's not too late or i would say um, uh, it's just not more than a decade when you know a lot of startups came on gallium nitride and currently there are a couple of com companies who are only few companies who are able to sell these devices in the market right now as i said we have been working on some of these technologies and uh, uh, to make it happen we basically Uh, I mean, more recently, we demonstrated India's first uh, e-mode gallium nitride hemp technologies, and how we did that. I mean, we worked on various aspects. We worked on making these technologies. I mean, gallium nitride, for instance, is normally uh, on by default, and we worked on making normally off e-mode devices. We worked on several reliability issues. Uh, so I'll not get into the details of this, but wanted to highlight that we worked on various technology aspects of some of these technology, uh, some of these uh, uh, technological options. and as a result of that you know this was almost 5 years of work and as a result of that we were able to report record high performance uh, uh you know uh, transistors uh, with record high 
uh, you know, uh, or uh, much higher reliability compared to the conventional technologies. And not just the transistor, we also worked on, on diodes because I mean, in any power electronic system, you, not, you need transistor as well as diode. And so we worked on tri diodes as well. And we were able to demonstrate record high performance and reliable gallium nitride diodes as well. So now having covered uh, the nanoscale CMOS uh, or the future of nano electronic technologies and wide band gap uh, semiconductors, uh, the last topic I have is, which is uh, the another interesting topic and possibly going to happen in future is, you know, is there a possibility of integrating these two, uh, you know, completely different threads? For instance, can you think of nanoscale power SOC? And I'll give you a background. For instance, uh, we already know that power SOCs are there where you integrate not just the power device, also the, uh, you know, the silicon based uh, uh, signal processing as well as the gate driver on the same chip, right? Now, if you want to replace that uh, uh, silicon power device on that chip with gallium nitride MOS, you can, you can think of doing that where you have silicon, uh, you know, uh, low voltage chip on the same chip and gallium nitride power MOS, and that is going to save your area significantly. Um, you know, to give you an idea, if you open any uh, any LED bulb, you will see a bulky power electronic converter over there. Now, can you think of replacing that converter, uh, which cost some good number, uh, by, a sim by a semiconductor chip, which does the same operation? And that semiconductor chip is certainly, you know, much cheaper compared to building a power electronic system. The other interesting, uh, uh, you know, possibility is that, you know, one approach is by integrating silicon with gallium nitride. The other approach is, can you, can you grow vertically? Can you grow, for instance, you know, let's say 2D material based uh, electronics uh, and 2D material based passives uh, and heat spreading capability on the same chip where the gallium nitride and silicon does the, uh, the, the switching operation, the power switching operation, whereas the 2D material does all the low voltage operation as well as the EMI shielding and heat spreading. So this was also a concept that we patented some time back uh, and you know, a couple of industries were quite interested in it. Uh, so with this, let me conclude. Uh, what I talked about is, I talked about uh, some of the future and next, gen next generation electronics. I talked about CMOS and uh, you know, how the CMOS is going to be converted to flexible and variable electronics. I talked about brain synapse chip, right? Uh, I talked about power and uh, eventually integrated power electronic systems and terahertz and optoelectronics, right? So I talked about a couple of uh, futuristic technologies and how the te semiconductor technology is going to evolve to some of these future technologies. Uh, as far as the industry is concerned, the world is concerned, you know, world see it happening in 10 to 15 years down the line uh, because of, you know, several hundred uh, billion dollar market, which is projected by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, in case of silicon CMOS and power, silicon power, we missed the bus. The question is, can we beat uh, and compete with the rest of the world and beat the roadmap as far as these future technologies are concerned, these next generation electronics, graphene and GAN and 2D material based uh, next generation electronics are concerned, uh, which is a very different ball game. I mean, because we don't need uh, learning from uh, uh, previous technologies. You, this is not dependent on, on any learning on failure from the future technologies. This also caters to disruptive technology and products. So therefore you don't have any you know, competition with the existing uh, market. All you need is, uh, the question is, can we jump the roadmap and take a lead? With this, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mayang. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation and uh, definitely we are sure the kind of uh, graphs and uh, that next generation electronics on graphene gallium nitride and 2d materials they are going to change the world and uh, india can take a lead on that because we have already done substantial work in isc under your leadership so i'm having few questions then i will go back to the questions being asked by attendees uh, I request all the participants to please write your questions in the Q&A window. We will be taking the questions immediately after this. Yeah. So, Professor Mank, you know that I work for ISRO. So, I, you are just wondering because you have shown very promising technologies of foldable uh, solar panels as well as uh, shielding materials so i just wanted to know how far away we are there from uh, developing those foldable uh, solar panels because you know 
uh, when we are using for satellite application, we are going and deploying the reflectors in orbit. If we can create a kind of a foldable solar panel, which is a kind of an umbrella, so we can just keep it, stow it, and when we are in the orbit, we can just deploy it. So and size will be very very big. So it will really help. So I just I wanted to know your perspective on that. Um, uh, I will I will answer this slightly differently. I mean, rather telling you exactly where the technology is and what is needed. I'll put it in this fashion that you know, as far as the foldable uh, PV technology is concerned, uh, the world has made significant progress. Progress even in IST, there there are a couple of people who have been working on some of these technologies, and you know they have made significant progress. Uh, what is needed at present is basically somebody uh, to invest on these technologies to let's say translate it from current TRL level three or four to TRL level seven or eight. I mean, as you know that, you know, converting any technology from TRL level three or four, which is a lab scale uh, technology or prototype demonstration to something which is demonstrated in field requires significant amount of effort, time and investment. And that is something which somebody has to come forward, say, OK, yes, we are interested in this technology and we must take it forward. And you know that is what is missing that is what is missing uh, broadly uh, i would say in in india where we have a lot of uh, uh, interesting things demonstrated but then often there is a delay in taking it forward to translate it from let's say trl level 3 4 to trl level uh, 7 8 9 uh, so i would say this is what is needed now coming back to a question um, uh, Things are not something that within a year you will have these technologies deployed, but uh, there is certainly significant progress where you know if you focus on uh, let's say translating it from lab scale prototype to uh, a field deployable system, uh, the technology is pretty much, uh, or I would say the fundamental understanding is pretty much matured that this kind of deployment has happened. I mean you know it that when you have to translate from TRL level three four to Seven eight nine. A lot of uh, investment uh, in terms of uh, optimization, reliability testing, yeah. uh, field testing has to be done, and that is what is uh, something which uh, only let's say you know um, uh, units like ISRO or any any uh, commercial entity can do, uh, and that is what uh, is required to be done at this stage. Okay, thank you. And now my next question is related to graphene because uh, you have shown it is uh, very, very weight is uh, extremely low and it is extremely conductive as well as it can be used for a uh, shielding material. So these three things are uh, promising as far as again space technology is concerned. So I just wanted to know how much shielding effectiveness we can get from these. Uh, how much is the bandwidth available? Um, the shielding effectiveness, the bandwidth is pretty broad. Um, you can basically, I mean, people have invested, investigated uh, all the way up to several tens of gigahertz. Uh, of course, uh, uh, that in, in an academic lab, this is also often limited to the systems that you have. For instance, in my lab, one can go up to 67 gigahertz. Uh, so this kind of demonstrations people have done. And I believe that uh, it can shield uh, to even higher frequencies as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the shielding effectiveness is concerned, uh, one uh, one mono layer gives you three dB uh, shielding effectiveness, and the shielding effectiveness is linear uh, to the uh, number of mono layers you integrate. So, for instance, if you want 10 dB, uh, 30 dB uh, shielding effectiveness, you just need 10 mono layers integrated on top of each other. This is, in fact, another concept. One mono layer. Thickness of one mono layer, uh, you know, is the thickness of one carbon atom. Oh, very nice. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So when you stack uh, these mono layers, I mean, in fact, we have a concept patented where uh, we came up with this idea of uh, something which can do both EMR shielding and uh, uh, heat spreading. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that to achieve uh, 30 dB shielding and uh, significant heat spreading, 
uh, you need, uh, you know, the thickness of the entire material would not be more than 10 nanometers. 10 nanometers. Okay, you, another important thing you told that heat is spreading. So how much heat it can uh, transmit from, uh, uh, suppose 10 kilowatt of power I have to take from one place to another place. Uh, how much uh, thickness uh, thermal mass is required for this? Uh, well, um, I can put it this way that, uh, you know, this depends on the heat density, not the total kilowatt power, because the total yeah. kilowatt power could be anything. I mean, the total 10 kilowatt power could be across, let's say, a one, one inch square area or could be uh, one centimeter yeah, square true. area or one micrometer square area. So power density is important. Uh, and the rate at which uh, the you know the uh, the region is getting heated up, uh, we have tested it in uh, in some of the systems. In fact, we uh, have uh, some industry collaboration where we also tested uh, this uh, in an industrial setup on their um, I would say laptop uh, SOC. And uh, as far as uh, those systems are concerned. Uh, couple of mono layers were able to spread heat uh, in a very nice way. Of course, we have to scale it up to the heat sink level, to the level which is, uh, you know, as equivalent to uh, the current uh, heat spreading uh, materials in these systems. But uh, the lab uh, demonstration shows that uh, the heat spreading capabilities are uh, much better compared to any other heat spreading material that you have currently available off the shelf. No, why I'm interested because uh, this has a unique combination of providing shielding effectiveness as well as heat spreading. So this is a really unique combination which is uh, required for uh, some of the applications where we are using high power application as far as RF uh, things are concerned where we need a material which yeah. This is a new concept. We in fact patented it and have been working uh, on this since uh, last year. Uh, so uh, you will not find much literature on this uh, where, you know, yeah. uh, one, one uh, or I would say universal platform to do both EMI shielding and heat spreading. Yes, that's what I was telling because uh, this is really unique and uh, congratulations for, to you for uh, doing this. I just wanted to know now from uh, lab prototype to commercially of the self uh, availability and then qualification for space, uh, whether you are planning to do something related to that. And uh, if yes, how much uh, time period do you see that you will be able to achieve that? Because I know you have developed in lab, but you know from lab to reality, a lot of work needs to be done. Well, if Pro finds it, uh, we will certainly take it forward beyond the lab uh, prototype. Uh, the time requirement is always a function of uh, investment you pump in because, you know, uh, with one person you can do uh, a certain amount of work and when you have the same team uh, multiplied to 10 people and uh, more resources, you can significantly push the work and do it much faster. So time is always a function of, uh, I mean, as far as the fundamental things are concerned, that is well understood. So uh, now the science aspects are understood, the engineering aspects need to be addressed and to address the engineering aspects, all you need is basically, uh, you know, uh, investment in terms of uh, of people and, and money. So that is- We will take it offline. Now I understood because it, it has become a between one to one discussion. We will go to the next question and anyway, we can discuss offline questions. So yes, I have now got a uh, lot of questions for you. I will read one by one and then I will request you to answer them. So, First question I would take, what are the chances of establishing a foundry in India? That's a good question. Um, there are two aspects of this question. One is that, is it possible to set up a foundry in India? I mean, from the technical point of view, uh, my answer to this question would be yes. Uh, you would hear a lot of, uh, I know uh, views from various different segments uh, or media article that, you know, uh, in India, you may not have uh, clean water or power and 
uh, or for these regions or enough manpower for these regions, uh, the foundry cannot be established. I uh, personally don't agree with that view. I believe uh, we have enough uh, manpower. I mean, uh, if we can generate so great manpower that, you know, Indian uh, design companies or design companies in India are catering to, uh, you know, all the uh, companies here and there, uh, we can certainly create enough manpower as far as the fab uh, or manufacturing is concerned. So that's, that's uh, not a problem. Clean water and power is also not a problem. We have done some exercise in the past on this and we know that uh, clean water and, and power is possible in India. Um, uh, so that is one part of the question that, you know, whether from the technical point of view, is it possible to have a fab? The second aspect is that, uh, I mean, uh, is it so big investment uh, that com countries like India cannot do? I can tell you no. Uh, even from the investment point of view, setting up a fab, for instance, require, depending on which fab you talk about, you know, you can set up an a 8-inch analog fab with $1 billion. Uh, if you want a 7 nanometer fab, you need 5 to $10 billion, depending on how what is the volume per day you want. Uh, if you want a gallium nitride fab, you just need $500 million. Uh, compared to the kind of, uh, you know, uh, economies with which, uh, uh, you know, we deal with or our government deals with, um, you know, anything which is even up to five, ten billion dollar is not a lot of money. We can certainly set up enough fabs uh, uh, in India in the same way as uh, Taiwan did with uh, the support of Taiwanese government. Yeah. So uh, there is just a supplementary question. Then uh, we have technologies, and uh, we have, in fact, the uh, government's willingness also you can see that uh, quantum communication they have allotted 8000 crores but why we are not able to convince our indian government to put at least uh, money so that we can establish at least one gan lab or foundry where we why we are not able to convince because you are uh, pitching this idea from last so many years so you may be aware so we wanted to know that um people are convinced uh, it's not that they are not convinced uh, that you know a gan fab or any similar fab should not happen um, it's just that uh, people are working on the nitty gritties and you know, um, understanding how we enable it in a more robust fashion uh, so i think uh, people need to just wait for some more time and uh, um, Possibly we start hearing uh, more from the government uh, in these directions. Okay, so there is a already positive uh, work is there, so good. Uh, I prefer to uh, be quoted neutral. Uh, I would say it come, uh, you know, um, okay. I think okay. uh, yeah. we just need to wait and watch. Okay. Uh, we respect your views, no problem. So another question is whether graphene is possible in 3D material? Um, I believe, I guess the question is whether graphene is possible to be integrated in 3D systems. Uh, because graphene is a 2D material. Uh, yeah. So if you make graphene 3D, which is, you know, then it becomes graphite. So it's not graphene. So for graphene to behave like graphene, it has to be 2D in nature. Uh, but as far as the integration is concerned, yes, it can be integrated with all kinds of systems, whether it is 2D or 3D. Okay. Next question is, how does atomic structure of graphene help in having flexible structure or electronics? Uh, well, you see, uh, graphene is one atom thick. Um, so you can bend it. And given very high, uh, you know, uh, tensile strength, when you bend it, it doesn't break. And that's the reason, and the same with the other 2D material, and that's the reason why, you know, you can bend a graphene-based electronics up to a certain extent. Of course, uh, one need to go into detail uh, into the mechanical properties and understand how much you can bend and, you know, uh, in, uh, between the two carbon atom, how much uh, angle bending can happen and so on. I don't want to get into those details. Uh, but as far as the uh, practical flexible electronics is concerned, 
uh, you know, uh, at a larger scale, you know, uh, when you bend something at a larger scale, the bending at that atomic scale is is much smaller, right? So you can think in this way that uh, you can you can design uh, flexible or bendable electronics without damaging uh, the uh, the structure of graphene uh, at the atomic scale. Thank you. Next question: To what extent GAN can influence e-mobility? What should be the infrastructure plan uh, to venture into e-mobility? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, the first part of the question is uh, how much GAN can help in e-mobility? <clears throat> um, yeah. GAN can help uh, in many ways. Uh, one is, let's say in e-mobility, I mean, we have been uh, talking to several uh, companies uh, or startups uh, in e-mobility sector. Um, and uh, with the following we learned from them, uh, what can attract them to switch from silicon to GAN. And this is following, one is uh, the weight of uh, electric vehicle is very important. Now, what is there as far as the weight is concerned? Um, of course, you need a certain weight for uh, for the balance of the vehicle. Now, above any above you know, any weight above that particular weight, which is required for balancing the vehicle, uh, is uh, excess weight, and that basically consume uh, battery power, right? And where is that weight? That weight comes from uh, electronics, right? Um, so any excess weight which comes from electronics, and most of these electronics is power electronics. Right, motor drives and power converters and so on. And if you can replace silicon by GAN, you are going to significantly reduce the size of the power electronic, which is there inside these E uh, vehicles, right? Uh, now, so one aspect is uh, reducing the weight. Now, if you reduce the weight, um, uh, what is going to happen is you are going to basically run your vehicle for a longer period, right? I mean, for instance, uh, typically, let's say for a scooter, uh, you would have, uh, you know, things like per charge will give you 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers for a given weight of vehicle. Now, if you reduce that weight by 10%, you know, uh, you get 10% extra kilometers, right? Which means you have to you have to charge the vehicle, you know, less uh, uh, less frequently. So that's certainly an advantage in terms of uh, changing from silicon to gallium nitride. Uh, if you um, you know if you talk about e mobility or e vehicles. Um, uh, second is when you go from, uh, let's say, uh, even, so let's say if you are charging less, uh, you also, uh, you know, your batteries become uh, more reliable because you are going to charge and discharge your batteries uh, lesser compared to uh, the case with silicon. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you consider all of that, of course, uh, switching from silicon to gallium nitride uh, is certainly advantageous for e-vehicles, uh, weight reliability, uh, uh, charging times, uh, cost of power electronics, cost of electronics and so on, the many, many uh, aspects. The other question was, uh, you know, what one should basically do. I think if you can read the other part of the question, uh, uh, this is related to what investment one has to do on, uh, on e-vehicle or? Oh, he is asking what should be the infrastructure plan to venture into e-mobility? Infrastructure is asking. Okay, uh, that's a tricky thing. I mean, uh, as for the infrastructure is concerned, uh, um, I mean, people who are in e-mobility, they have enough infrastructure. Uh, they don't need any new infrastructure if they want to switch from silicon electronics to GAN electronics. Um, if you want to start fresh, uh, then I think uh, there's a lot of infrastructure needed. Uh, when uh, starting with the, the vehicle design to the power electronic design and so on. Um, I don't think that in this session I can give, uh, I can list out what all is needed, but uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, this can be studied um, and, uh, and listed out. This is not, uh, this is not something which can be listed out uh, just in a QA and session, but as far as the existing uh, EMA vehicle companies are concerned, they have enough infrastructure and for them, uh, nothing new is needed. If the question is from uh, somebody from such a company, for them, nothing new is needed if they want to switch from, from silicon to GAN. Good. 
Now, next question is, I think uh, he is from microwave engineering background. So he is asking, what is the future for microwave engineers? Context, I am not very clear whether it's respect to gallium nitride or graphene, but only one line question is there. What is the future for microwave engineers? The future is bright. Uh, the reason is that, uh, you know, in the past, uh, the technology to manipulate, um, I would say, I, I believe microwave means it's, you know, person is not specific to a particular frequency, and I believe yeah. the future of future of microwave is more towards higher frequencies like milli millimeter wave technologies and so on. And in that context, I would say future is bright for multiple regions. One is you know you don't get many of these uh, RF engineers these days. Second is uh, earlier the technology to manipulate uh, and control millimeter wave radiation. Um, and you know all the other radiations in much higher frequency domain were not available, uh, but as you know more and more technologies are coming up. For instance, gallium nitride, indium phosphide, uh, graphene, and so on. Those technologies are possible, and if you make a transistor which can cater to those frequencies, then you also need engineers who can design system around those frequencies. So, you know, in keeping all this in mind, I would say future is certainly bright. Yeah, another question, interesting question. How can an industry standard device modeling researcher contribute for India's innovative electronic production market? Because most of your work is based on device architecture. How can a device modeler contribute, say, in industries like ISRO, DRDO? Well, uh, if you want to build a system, everyone's contribution is important. Um, so for instance, I work on technology. Uh, I work on understanding science, understanding why something doesn't work, understanding why, uh, you know, what are the fundamental challenges in enabling a technology and so on, understanding the physics of reliability. And I use all this understanding to basically develop newer technologies, newer device architectures, uh, enable new material based technologies and so on, right? Now, once uh, the technology is there, uh, right, I mean, you need uh, designers to build system around it. Uh, but how this, uh, how the designers are going to build system around it? I mean, you need somebody who can model all these devices and give, uh, you know, these models uh, to these designers who can design using these models, right? So, you know, as I said, everyone's contribution is important. So, like someone like me would contribute in terms of technology platform. Uh, someone like, uh, you know, um, a system designer or a chip designer would contribute in terms of system or chip design. And in between comes these modelers who will model the uh, the device and help uh, the designer understand the device uh, in their language uh, so that they can design a system around it. Yeah, true. So it is a team work rather than an individual work. So we have to think in that fashion. Now coming to next question. At present, which FinFET technology is designed? Nanometer is in the market. Five nanometer is in development. Okay, now next question is how good is the future for bioelectronics? Um, so everybody is asking about future from you. <laughs> that's why it makes my life tough because no uh, <laughs> predicting future is one aspect. Yeah. And, uh, they have seen already you have projected so many graphs and you have claimed also that till 2017 whatever you have projected is quite uh, matching so well, let me put it this way uh, okay uh, let's extrapolate from the past um, in 15 years back nobody heard of bioelectronics 15 years back you want to do any test uh, you use all conventional methods right i mean you want to basically uh, get any test uh, in your body with your blood or whatever, you use all very conventional methods, right? But in last 15 years, we have seen significant changes and advancement in the way, uh, let's say uh, many of these aspects are monitored or tested uh, from our body. From blood sugar to, uh, uh, to oxygen saturation to cholesterol and whatnot. I'm, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know many of those terminologies, but uh, I can say that you know if we extrapolate from there, and then we add uh, the the newer technologies which are emerging 
in the recent time, for instance, most of these bioelectronics are dependent on the advancement in the sensor technology in the last 10 years, right? And if you see the kind of new materials which have, uh, which are available to develop better and better sensors, and if we add that to the projection, uh, certainly the, the future of bioelectronic or the growth of bioelectronic is certainly going to be exponential in nature. This is how I see it. Very good. Thank you. And next question is why GAN over LDMOS? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, um, if you um, look into the architecture uh, and, you know, uh, the performance numbers, for instance, uh, what you can achieve uh, with LDMOS um, when you, you know, when you get into the 100 to 600 volt segment, you can achieve the same with uh, GAN. Uh, where the size of the GAN would be at least four to five times smaller. Uh, this is one. Second is the, um, the performance of the GAN uh, would be around six to eight times higher than LDMOS. So what you get is for a given voltage operation or for a given op uh, no, uh, operating voltage, you get uh, four times to five times uh, saving in an area is the cost on on. on and uh, you get eight, six to eight times improvement in the performance and improvement in the performance is the reduction in the system size, right? So you save uh, the chip cost by four to five times and you also reduce the system cost by 30 to 40%. And that's the reason why, you know, you would like to switch from uh, silicon LDMOS to gallium nitride in this 100 to 600 volt segment. Very good. So next question is, is there any disadvantages of using graphene battery in mobile phone? Disadvantage of using graphene battery in mobile phone? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, when they get qualified, there won't be any disadvantage. Uh, that I can tell you. At present, it cannot be answered because, you know, things are yet not at a qualification stage. Next quickly what are the main issues in GAN, uh, GAN technology right now uh, the biggest issue which uh, uh, you know the international community including our group see is uh, is reliability um, because uh, I mean in silicon things are pretty much straightforward I mean this was a single crystal silicon and you have a silicon oxide based uh, gate stack but in GAN, uh, things are very different. Uh, the material is very different. The material is quite funny in nature. Uh, the, the electron transport across this material is very different. Uh, several things are yet not understood. Um, and uh, often the reliability behavior depends on, you know, or the failure behavior depends on, you know, whether you are testing it right or not. And if you don't know under what scenarios it can fail, you possibly have not tested it yet. You know, it's like COVID. If you have not tested, you don't know whether something is positive or not, right? So uh, same way in the GAN, if you have not tested under those scenarios, you really don't know whether under those scenarios, the material will pass or fail. Uh, and people are still exploring, you know, all different ways in which the material can fail. And only once that exploration is over and once we have understood all phenomena very well and we have, and then only we can address all kind of reliability challenges. So at present reliability is, uh, is the biggest threat uh, to gallium nitride devices. Uh, the devices are available in market, but you know, they come with uh, a lot of over design. Yeah, reliability is very, very important aspect. Uh, so I should really look into that. Then only we can commercialize it. Next question is being asked uh, by Divakar, uh, what will be the role of organic electronics in emerging electronics industry? Um, interesting question. Um, 10 years back, the answer to this question would have been uh, that yes, uh, organic electronics could be a potential technology in future. Uh, but now I see that uh, organic electronics um, has a lot of competition with 2D materials because you know, on one hand, organic electronics can offer you flexible capability, but organic electronics, uh, you know, doesn't offer you high performance capability. 
2D materials offer you both flexibility, uh, mechanical flexibility, as well as uh, high performance uh, compared to organic electronics. So now the answer would have, I would say answer is different. And I would say that possibly organic electronics uh, is getting tough competition with 2D material and highly likely that 2D material uh, you know, uh, is going to basically beat organic electronics. And this is particular to electronics. I'm not talking optoelectronic or LEDs or, uh, or display or anything else. Next question is again, interesting question. What is the future of TV with integrated power? Any work in India towards this? TV with integrated power. Is, uh, whatever TVs we see in market today, they all come with integrated. Okay, integrated power, not power converter. Uh, yes. This is an engineering question. I mean, do you want TV with integrated power? What will you do with TV with integrated power? I mean, uh, when you say TV, which means this is fixed at some place, right? I mean, uh, you're not going to carry TV in your pocket. Uh, you anyway carry your laptop and tablet and handheld devices and cell phone in your pocket, which can also work like TV. But when we say TV, you know, in current world, we are aware of TVs, which are at least, you know, uh, 40 inches uh, wide or possibly even bigger than that. And that's something we cannot carry in our pocket. Uh, so if we are not carrying in our pocket, why do we need uh, integrated power, right? I mean, you don't want to create a system which has no need in the market. True. We should solve the problem. What is required for the general public, rather than uh, we know the technology and create the product. I mean, one can do integrated TV with the, with integrated power or battery or whatever. But uh, a, they're going to be so bulky, expensive, and nobody will buy it. And also, it has no use when the TV is fixed at some wall in your in your home or office, and you can certainly feed that TV with AC power. There's no need uh, to develop something which comes with integrated power. Correct. Another question, I will take now a few questions only because we are already late and we are already 8.22. Uh, we have asked your one hour time, but already one hour, 20 minutes. We may take a few questions in your next session if possible, but uh, I will take at least two questions. First one is what drastic change may happen if the silicon is replaced by gallium nitride in the field of electronics and in the day to day life of people. Uh, okay, first of all, silicon cannot be replaced completely by gallium, nitri gallium nitride uh, in the field of electronics. Uh, the reason is gallium nitride, as I said, is projected and you know can only cater to 100 volt to 600 volt or little beyond. Uh, in the power device segment, right? I mean, power device segment is much smaller compared to the overall semiconductor electronic. I mean, the overall semiconductor market is 400 plus billion dollars. And within that power device market is around uh, uh, 17 to 18 billion dollars. And within that gallium nitride at present is uh, less than $1 billion. Now, um, so you can think in this way that, you know, uh, that already the gallium nitride projections are much smaller compared to the overall world semiconductor market. And of course, this caters to a much larger electronic, uh, uh, you know, uh, electronics market. And within that electronics market, the power device market, a uh, power system market is, you know, just little higher than $100 billion. And anything which is going to be replaced by gallium nitride is not going to be a few tens of billion dollars, right? So gallium nitride cannot replace silicon completely. Gallium nitride can replace silicon only in a certain segment. And for rest of the segment, silicon will continue. And that's where my, my point was that, you know, uh, silicon will continue. Uh, what can, uh, you know, what can help silicon uh, surviving uh, for a little longer? So one was, for instance, you invest more and more on analog applications or analog foundries. Uh, and if silicon has to be replaced, that will be replaced by, you know, something like uh, 2D materials or possibly anything which may get discovered in future better than 2D materials, but certainly not gallium nitride. Thank you. I will take uh, last question. Since quantum computing is being forecasted immensely as a future, 
which are the best 2D material supporting quantum computing and is India working on the same? Well, um, things are not reached to a point where you can, you can zero into a one given 2D material. I would say different groups are exploring different 2D material broadly, you know, um, yeah, I mean, different 2D materials. Um, uh, so at this stage, you cannot zero into one 2D material. If you look into the 2D material family, there are, there are hundreds of 2D materials and uh, depending on various groups and their expertise in different materials, they are working on, you know, all kinds of different materials. Uh, so at this stage, it's, it's very difficult to, to zero in to one given material. Uh, what was the other part of the question? One was uh, uh, this material and other was. One second, I, uh, I went ahead because I wanted to see whether any another interesting question is there. I will come back to this. Yeah, one second. He's asking uh, whether uh, India is working on quantum computing. Oh, yes. There, which are is several uh, groups, uh, there are several groups working on quantum computing. In fact, Government of India announced uh, a lot of funding on quantum computing uh, or quantum technologies in general. Uh, and I can tell you that there are a lot of groups, uh, and not just in ISC, but at other places, IIT Bombay, TIFR, IIT Delhi. Madras and whatnot. So there are many groups in India who are working on quantum computing or quantum technology. Uh, one last question. I can see there uh, is a is asking. I do work in analog IC design. I would like to know how to compare circuit performances in different process technology nodes. Is there any scaling factor by which we can straight way convert circuit performance in different modes? It's a very specific question. I can offer uh, a response over email, uh, but a quick response okay. could be following that uh, there, there's no straightforward way by which you can compare circuit performance uh, of one node to the other node. You have to design in different nodes and then compare. There is no uh, factor by which, or there's no magic parameter by which you can scale from one node to the other node and just uh, do a quick comparison if you have designed in one node and you get an idea about the other node. Uh, but any more detail, uh, I can certainly answer over email. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Mayank, for sparing time with us and providing your perspective on the future of world electronics and possible role India can play. After going through your presentation, it is my firm belief that yes, if uh, we are doing the right thing and we are not doing the things the way we have missed the silicon bus definitely we are going to be the world leader uh, in electronics and uh, especially the field of graphene 2d materials as well as gallium nitride where uh, we can uh, do meaningful things because uh, we have already developed the technologies as far as uh, India is concerned, only thing implementation and commercialization is pending. Otherwise, as far as technologies are concerned, we know the technologies and we can definitely mature those technologies. True. These words, we will be looking forward for your uh, very, very technical presentation. I think I have leave, left most of the technical questions for your next presentation because most of them, they may be covered in the presentation and then may we mean not need the questions, but I request all the participants who have participated today, please join Professor Mayank's uh, session on June 11th again. And just to remind you that you have to register for each and every individually. Now that one for one session you are registering, and then you will get the link for another session also. So, uh, with those words, I would like to have a concluding remark from and then we can uh, close this session. Um, thanks, Puneet. Uh, thanks for organizes, organizing this. Uh, thanks to the audience for hanging around and asking, uh, and particularly, you know, asking wonderful questions. Uh, they were really good questions. And I see more and more questions are getting posted. So uh, I can offer answers uh, uh, over email if uh, I have missed to answer any question. 
I can understand that uh, Puneet cannot uh, take all the questions uh, in a limited time that we have. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I must thank all of you and I look forward to, uh, to see everyone again on 11th, uh, where we will have uh, uh, a more detailed uh, and technical, you know, in-depth technical talk on graphene and 2D material work that we have done. Um, and uh, looking into the questions, in fact, I also thought that possibly sometime in the future, I'll also give uh, another talk on, on gallium nitride. Um, uh, yes. That will be really good. Questions yeah. over there. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you on again, June 11th. And audience, we'll be having uh, tomorrow, same time, another presentation with another experts. So visit us. Thank you very much.